Jackie. I'm a nursing student at Aspen University. I'm in the Adult Health 2 session this time. Um, for our first assignment, we were asked to watch a video regarding the respiratory system and answer some questions um, about the video. Um, so the first two questions are asking to describe the process of the um, inhalation and exhalation uh, with the respiratory system. So uh, when we, uh, as humans, uh, breathe in oxygen through either the mouth or the nose, that goes through the uh, trachea, which is also called the windpipe. Um, the oxygen then goes through the uh, two um, main or bigger, big tubes of the big airways, which is the left and the right bronchi, uh, which then goes through smaller airways called the bronchioles. Um, within the bronchioles, there are what they call alveoli, uh, which is where the gas exchange occurs. Um, so in exchange with the oxygen, um, the capillary uh, uh, that's in the alveoli um, excretes the carbon dioxide, which is then exhaled out um, of the, the body. Um, so during the inhalation process, um, there's a couple functions that, that occur. So the diaphragm, which is in the uh, which is under the lungs, it's a, it's a muscle um, that divides the thoracic cavity with the abdominal cavity. Um, so when the diaphragm contracts, um, as well as the accessory muscles and the and the muscles of the of the of the ribs, what happens is that it um, increases the lung capacity or lung volume in the in the lungs, uh, which then decreases the pressure in the lungs and increases the pressure outside the lungs. Um, so when it's time to exhale, uh, the diaphragm relaxes, all the other muscles relax, uh, causing the uh, lungs to the lung, the lung volume to decrease, uh, which then increases the pressure inside the lungs and decreases the pressure outside the lungs. So that's kind of how the inhalation exhalation process works. And the video that we were we were told to watch kind of gives a visual of how that works with with using household items such as balloons and stuff. So I thought that was pretty cool um, to, to watch to visually see how that works. Um, some reasons why uh, individuals may have larger lung capacities than others could be due to a lot of factors such as age, uh, gender, body composition, and ethnicity. Uh, males and tall statured individuals tend to have greater uh, total lung capacities compared to others. Um, with ethnicities, um, African Americans tend to have a lower lung capacity compared to other ethnicities. Um, other factors such as uh, physical activity levels, chest wall deformities, and respiratory diseases such as COPD and emphysema can affect uh, how large or small a patient's lung capacity um, is. Um, individuals who are more physically fit tend to have a higher or larger lung capacity because they have worked their lungs through these tough workouts um, to train them and, and, and uh, provide more oxygenation to get through, to get through those, those tough workouts. Um, compared to individuals who are not physically fit or not physically active, where it's difficult for them to breathe just with low and, and low moderate uh, workouts. Uh, with age, um, some, with anything else, everything kind of tends to lose its function or lose its ability to do to its function. Everything kind of deteriorates. Um, in this case, older individuals have a lower lung capacity as the muscles of the diaphragm uh, weaken and the lung tissue uh, loses its outlet elasticity, uh, causing the airways to become narrower, uh, making it harder for, for these older patients to, to breathe. Um, the next question is asking to describe how asthma affects the lungs. Um, so the asthma is a chronic inflammatory lung disease that causes the airways, airways of the lungs to narrow, uh, causing airway obstruction. Um, allergens, air pollutants, cold weather, physical exertion, Strong odors and medications are common predisposing factors for patients uh, with asthma. Um, these, these triggers result in immediate inflammatory response, uh, causing these patients to, to experience uh, bronchospasms, which makes, which makes it easy, uh, harder uh, for these patients to, to breathe. Um, some signs and symptoms that nurses can, can see with patients who are having asthma attacks would be shortness of breath, um, coughing, wheezing, um, increased mucus production, fatigue, uh, restlessness, kind of anxious, um, increased respirations, 
um, cyanosis, um, this bluish, that bluish discoloration, either fingertips, lips, um, those are some, some signs and symptoms that nurses can, can see or should monitor uh, when patients are having these, these asthma attacks. Um, care plans in, with these patients would be to maintain airway patency, so keep that airway open as much as possible, and preventing these triggers from uh, causing these patients to have these, these attacks. Uh, assessing or management of, of for patients with asthma would be, would be to uh, no, assess vital signs, assess the respiratory system either by auscultating the lung sound, uh, watching the depth and the and the rhythm of the respirations. Are they shallow? Are they deep? Are they fast? Are they slow? Um, you know, assessing for for the signs and symptoms, like I mentioned, for these patients. Uh, monitoring oxygen saturation. Uh, maybe getting checking the arterial blood gas. Um, and then some interventions that nurses can use for these patients with asthma would be to uh, keep the head of the bed up to make it easier for these patients to breathe. Uh, providing some medications such as uh, bronchodilators and uh, corticosteroids to to re to uh, dilate the the airways again to get that airflow going, um, and to also reduce the inflammation, um, allowing the patient to rest, uh, maintaining hydration um, to help thin out the mucus, um, since asthma can cause some mucus production. So. Um, keeping the patient hydrated can help thin out those mucus, uh, making it easier for, for the patients to breathe, and then to provide some supplemental oxygenation since in these situations, since the, the airways are kind of obstructed, um, there's not a lot of oxygen going, going on, so we have to give these, these patients some supplemental oxygen to, to get that, keep that oxygen um, in an optimal uh, level. Um, some things that nurses can educate these patients with asthma to help uh, maintain and, and, and may possibly improve the respiratory um, system would be to maintain a healthy weight because excess weight can cause the respiratory system to overwork. Um, drink plenty of water, like I said, to help thin out those mucus uh, and make it easier for, for the patients to breathe. Uh, maintain a healthy diet to keep them healthy uh, and to reduce inflammation and fight off any infections or um, foreign pathogens. Um, practice good hygiene, not only for themselves but for the for people around them to keep everyone you know safe and healthy. Um, limit the exposure to the triggers: allergens, pollen, dust, mold, uh, toxins, um, odors. Um, try to educate the patients to avoid those 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 triggers as much as possible, so they don't have these these attacks as much. Um, uh, be physically active to maintain overall good quality of life, keep it, keeping yourself healthy, um, and also, you know, help strengthen that, that respiratory system um, so it doesn't have to work as much. Um, and then make sure you're having, you have medications with you um, on hand in case, you know, you have these attacks. Out of nowhere, uh, the most common uh, one would be the albuterol, which is the bronchodilator. It's also called a rescue inhaler. A lot of patients with asthma uh, should have should have this medication with them wherever they go, um, just in case they do have these attacks. They're able to to administer this medication help help get them through these these attacks um, successfully. Um, some resources in Arizona that uh, nurses can provide to to patients with asthma would be the um, Arizona Asthma Coalition, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for clear air and provides and uh, works to to provide better access to healthcare for people who do have asthma in Arizona. Um, they also work with schools to provide the resources and the training uh, for the staff so they can help recognize when students do have these asthma attacks, um, that they're, they're well trained and, and informed of how to, to handle these situations. Uh, another resource would be the Arizona Department of Health Services, which provide information to the public of what asthma is, um, how to manage it, how to prevent it, uh, they also, they also uh, have programs that are working to control this chronic illness and develop the resources that are, you know, affordable and accessible for these patients who, who do have asthma in, um, in Arizona. Uh, for the kids specifically, there's an uh, educational program called Camp Not A Wheeze, 
um, that's based in Arizona um, that helps children with moderate to severe asthma um, as well as their, their families to learn how to effectively uh, manage this illness and still have an active, active lifestyle um, and, you know, keep, have a bright future for these children um, and still have this, this, and not let this illness uh, prevent that, um, prevent them from not having a bright future for them. Um, so I hope you learned something from this video about the respiratory system and um, thank you so much for watching.